And this is Jérôme Ergeau, um, student, uh, a PhD student at Sciences Po, Berkman Fellow, uh, um, core member of cooperation uh, uh, group here, and um, here to present a, a piece of work that's been going on for a while and coming up with interesting things and is really in many senses the first major connection between experimental economics and extensive field observation, uh, as well as some really interesting application of experimental tools to uh, the, the design of peer production communities. And it's just a thrill to see you here and, and uh, looking forward to hearing your presentation. Well, thank you, Yochai, for those very kind of introductory words. Uh, this is indeed a paper about um, pro-social motivations to uh, contribute to Wikipedia. But let me first try and uh, give you a little bit of a sense of the broader research agenda or motivation that's uh, behind it. Uh, so usually, when I present uh, this research to a crowd of economists, what I ask them to do is to think about uh, all those computer-based products that you see here appearing on the screen, which are certainly of high value to many people, which are produced by highly successful firms that compete in the labor market trying to attract the best engineers. And what I tell them is that I would like to talk about a somewhat recent phenomenon that has taken off in the last decade or so, a little bit more, uh, whereby uh, people gather uh, over the internet, voluntarily self-assigned work without any kind of price signal or market coordination without any kind of pre-designed um, formal design rule or leadership and successfully coordinate towards the provision of functional free equivalents of those firm-based products, sometimes successfully driving those for-profit counterparts out of their original markets. Right? And so this emerging production model that following Yochai's uh, insight, I will call here peer production. The success of this emerging model is difficult to understand, at least to an economist, through the assumptions of standard economic theory about individual preferences, namely perfect rationality and self-interest. Right? And so this paper is really about trying to understand what, how we can start to unpack the success and the functioning of that model uh, by appealing to economic theories that uh, rely on non-standard economic preferences. Um, and we want to start doing that, focusing on Wikipedia for two very good reasons. That is, on Wikipedia, uh, Wikipedia is kind of a particularly clean study site for peer production because you do not have, or not very much, not very many, economic incentives involved. So, for instance, you have uh, no extrinsic incentives to contribute to Wikipedia. It's very difficult to get paid to contribute to Wikipedia and sustain your contributions. And at the same time, there are no signaling value that you can derive from your contributions on the labor market. So it's very rare, although I suspect it's going to be increasingly the case in the future, that Wikipedia contributors put their contributions on their resume. And so in that respect, I kind of like that quote by Kizor, who is a Wikipedia administrator, who tells us the problem with Wikipedia is that it only works in practice. In theory, it can never work. <laughs> and what I'd really like you uh, to, to do here is to think about the decision to contribute to Wikipedia as a public goods dilemma. So a public goods dilemma is a situation that economists have been studying for quite a while now. And it's any kind of situation in which you can decide to take an action that has a private cost to yourself um, and also a private benefit. As it turns out, the private benefit that you can derive from taking this action is lower than the private cost. On the other hand, the benefit to society of incurring taking that action is higher than your private cost. So here is the tension, right? If you were perfectly self-interested and rational, you would never take such, a, such an action because all you care about is the ratio of your personal cost to your personal benefit, right? However, taking that action may be socially efficient. So if you think about the decision to format and put some idea or knowledge that you have in shape, to put it in there in Wikipedia, that's costly to you. What do you benefit from it? Well, you already know that information, right? So you can presume that the cost is higher than your benefit for yourself. However, this has huge benefits, benefits uh, to society in general. So this is the tension. 
So economists have been studying um, at, in theoretical models the kind of pro-social preferences that could push people to contribute to those kind of global public goods. And those generally appeal to pro-social preferences that meaning that you do not only care about your own payoffs in that game, but you will put into your own utility function the utility of other people in the game. You will take into consideration the actions of other people into your own utility function, and that will push you towards cooperation and overcoming that uh, public goods dilemma. So there has been three classes of models that economic theory has been putting forward in order to uh, rationalize people often observe willingness to, co to cooperate in public goods like environment, and that traces back to the work of Eleanor Ostrom. Um, the first kind of motive uh, that has been put forward historically by the theory is based on altruism, sheer altruism. Uh, the second class of motive that we have is based on reciprocity, meaning that you will be willing to respond in kind to kind actions of others. If others contribute to the public good, you'll be willing to contribute. So this is an example of negative reciprocity, but I'm going to mostly talk about positive reciprocity uh, in, in, in that respect. And kind of the last kind of, of, of motive, pro-social motive that's been put forward by economic theory is based on social image, whereby by incurring a personal cost to contribute to the public good, you want to signal some quality about yourself to other people, and by, by being able to do so, you will derive a certain utility, right? So this is very unlike the two other motives, the reciprocity and the altruism one, which do not rely on other people watching your do what, what you're doing to be at work, right? So social image is really about when you allow other people to watch, how do you respond? So what we're going to do in this paper. So we have those theories around, and those theories have been extensively tested in physical university labs, but what we're going to do here is something different. We're going to elicit the social preferences of a representative sample of Wikipedia contributors with an online experiment that we will couple with, with observational data, and then we will use those preferences to try and predict subjects' field contributions to Wikipedia. What's the value added to our knowledge or economic theory in general? Well, this is the first comprehensive test that we have of the relative role of each theoretical class of social motive for incentivizing contributions to real world public goods. And this is one public good that really matters to the world. Uh, so we're going to try and run some kind of a horse race between those explanations, altruism versus reciprocity versus social image, using this experimental data and seeing whether they predict or not the number of contributions that people make to Wikipedia. So let me talk about the design of the experiment a little bit. I'm going to rely on very standard uh, experiment that has been used for a very long time in experimental economics to try and tease out those preferences. So I'm going to try and measure all of those three classes of preferences, each time giving you two alternative measures so that I can check for the consistency of the results uh, that we get. So let us start with the reciprocity motive. What I'm going to do is that I'm going to run a very simple public goods game. That's the translation in experimental economics with monetary payoffs of the public goods situation that I explained to you before. Um, so imagine that you're playing with three other people in a group. Each one of you is endowed with $10, right? Each one of you has a decision to make how many dollars you want to invest in a common project and how many dollars you want to keep for yourself. Each dollar that you decide to invest in the common project yields a private benefit to you of 0.4. You invest one, you get 0.4 back. That's obviously not efficient at the individual level, but it also yields a payoff of 0.4 for the other three members of the group. That is, for each dollar that you invest, the group as a whole gets 1.6. So here you have the tension, right, between your own private self-interest and the interest in the group of, in general. And what we're going to do here is that we're going to allow you to condition your contributions on the contribution of the other group members. If the other group members give zero, how much do you want to give? If they give one, two, three, up to ten. And we're going to take the proportion of your endowment that you conditionally contribute to that public good 
as a measure of your reciprocity motive, right? How much you're prone to conditional cooperation. This is going to be our first measure of reciprocity. A second measure of reciprocity that we're going to consider is a very standard one, too, is based on the trust game that's been used extensively. Uh, here, what I'm going to do is that I'm going to divide the sample of Wikipedia contributors who are going to participate in this online experiment in trusters and trustees. The trustees are the, guy, uh, the guys in orange uh, here uh, on the screen. And those are the guys I'm going to be interested in here. Both players have an endowment of $10. The truster uh, in, in, in green here has the opportunity to transfer whatever amount he wants to the trustee and keep the rest for himself. Whatever amount he transfers out of his $10 is multiplied by three. And then the trustee in orange has a private decision to make. How much of the amount that he receives he wants to send back to that truster? knowing that he has absolutely no obligation to do so. And if he were perfectly rational and interested, he would never return anything in the first place, right? So I'm going to take the proportion of the amount that you receive that you decide to send back to the truster as a measure, an experimental measure, of your reciprocity <coughs> uh, motive. That guy has been trusted me, trans trusting me. He's been kind to me. You feel an impulse to respond in kind. That's what I'm going to try to get at here. By the way, the decision to send here by the green guy, the truster, is uh, considered generally a measure of general trust towards anonymous strangers. Uh, and we're going to rely on that maybe uh, a little bit later on if I ever get there. Um, but for the time being, the trustee's behavior in terms of how much he wants to send back is, is what, what's interesting to us. OK, so, so far, yeah. When you say these games have sort of been extensively used, do they, have they been correlated to like actual practices? And so, so lots of people play this game. We have patterns of their distribution in these games. And then we observe them in other kinds of settings where we're like, oh, the person who gave away Almost. was really trusting there, also was really trusting when we saw them in the grocery store doing this thing in the real world. So that's, that's, that's the whole purpose of this paper. We, we almost have no evidence uh, okay. that those, the behavior in those games that have been used extensively to test economic theories in the lab, how people behave, how do those map actually to behavior outside of the lab. So we have a few papers about shrimp catchers and things like that, where they cooperate in common pool resources and things like that. But Wikipedia is much more interesting, right? <laughs> so yeah, and this is also the first comprehensive test. We have all those motives here in the same frame, and we can study how they uh, interact with one another. So this is the, this is the kind of value added here. And repeat, and repeat no, 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 no. The, the role are fixed, okay. fixed roles. So, so far, so good for the reciprocity motives. We have two measures, one based on the public goods game, the other one based on the trust game. What about altruism? Well, the workhorse for studying altruism in the uh, experimental economics literature is the dictator game. So we're going to run a standard version of the dictator game. Again, remember here, all the interactions in those games are one shot totally anonymous, and the Wikipedians are not playing with one another. They are playing with other internet users are at large, and they know this. So what we're trying to get at here are deep preferences in an anonymous setting. So dictator game. This is a very simple game in which we're going to divide the population of uh, participants into a dictator and a receiver. The dictator is endowed with $10. The receiver is not endowed with anything. The dictator has a choice to transfer whatever amount he wants to the receiver, and that's the end of the game. So basically, the receiver has no say in the interaction here. He has no decision to make. He has no opportunity to influence the decision of the dictator so that the amount that the dictator is willing to transfer in that game can only be interpreted as sheer altruism towards an anonymous stranger. right? So I'm going to take the proportion of your endowment that you're willing to transfer to that random stranger as a measure of your baseline altruism. Right? However, because we worry that people may be incentivized to contribute to Wikipedia not out of a sense of general altruism towards the public, but out of a sense of altruism towards their fellow in-group of Wikipedia contributors, in this particular setting, we're going to run a modified version of the game where we will tell explicitly our Wikipedians, now you're being paid with another wiki type of contributor, how much you want to give. This is going to be a measure of directed altruism in a sense. 
And this is going to be our second measure of altruism uh, that we're going to use here. So far, so good. Reciprocity, altruism, two experimental measures each time. What about social image? Well, social image is something that's kind of difficult to measure experimentally, uh, it's even more so in a decontextualized context um, that economists like to use uh, in experiments. So what we're going to do here is that we're going to rely on the wealth of observational data that's available from, from Wikipedia to try and get indicators of whether people are concerned with their social image within the Wikipedia community or not and assess the impact that that has on the number of contributions that they make. So the first thing that we're going to use are Wikipedia personal user pages. So let me just ask uh, first, how many people in that room have a Wikipedia account? That's so cool. I've been presenting <laughs> that paper in many, many economics conferences. And each and every time I ask that question, I have one guy to immediately waving half of his hands at the end of the room. So it's kind of nice. So I won't have to explain as much. Um, Basically, each and every, so when you, when you create a Wikipedia account for yourself, the system asks you for a username that you have to choose, and that automatically creates two pages that hold your name. One of them is your Wikipedia user page. This Wikipedia user page is blank by definition, but you can post on it information about yourself. You can present yourself to the community, explain who you are, and stuff like that. The important thing about it is that it's not crucial to the functioning of Wikipedia. You can perfectly be a very engaged Wikipedia contributor and have a totally blank personal user page and still be able to perfectly contribute in an efficient way. And so what we're going to do here is, um, here is an example of, of, of a user page. Um, that contributor, just as an example, tell us I was born in Windsor, Ontario, Canada, blah, 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 blah. Uh, lots of information. I strongly believe that sports are to be participated in and not watched. Here is the kind of things that you can say in your Wikipedia user page. So very simple indicator. What we're going to do is we're going to measure the size of that user page in bytes and <coughs> consider as social signalers, so to speak, the subjects who have a user page whose size in bytes is higher than the median in the sample. Those who have a user page whose size is low is lower than the median in the sample would be considered as relatively less concerned with their social image with the community. That's going to be one measure. A second measure, as always, trying to check for consistency, is going to rely on some awesome data that was collected by my fellow fellows, Michael Hill and Aaron Cho, with whom I, I was fortunate to interact and, and work for the past couple of years. Um, and this is going to make use of barn stars data. So what are barn stars? Barn stars are a social rewarding practice that's mainly restricted to highly engaged contributors but that anybody can, can do. Um, basically, if you come across some awesome contribution that another contributor has made to the Wikipedia project, you may want to leave him a, an image of a star that goes along with some personalized text acknowledging the contribution. Here is an example. Uh, here is a Wikipedian who thanks another one for being one of those awesome Wikipedians who produces great content in a collegiate manner, helping out all over, and great dispute resolution. Those kind of awards, you won't post them on, your, on the Wikipedia user page of the contributor, the one that he controls and he uses to present himself to the community. You're going to post it on the second page that's automatically created when you create your Wikipedia account, your Wikipedia talk page. Unlike the user page, this page is crucial to the functioning of the Wikipedia community. This is where people leave you messages, try to coordinate work, ask you for references, and maybe, hopefully, if you do a very good job and have hundreds, thousands of contributions, we'll post you one of those awards. So now, once you receive one of those on your talk page, after some time, the award is likely to disappear in the flow of conversation. It's going to be archived in old conversations. So that it's not easy for people to recognize that we received one of those. And briefly speaking, as it turns out, and this is the brilliant idea uh, of Michael Hill and Aaron Shaw, um, approximately half of, Wiki of the Wikipedians decide to circumvent this by manually moving those awards from their talk page to their user page, which they control. 
so that it will be displayed for everybody to see forever, right? And so what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to simply conditional on receiving a barn star. And this is very important because this is going to constrain my sample of Wikipedians to highly engaged contributors. You are very unlikely to get one of those if you're a newbie. Um, conditional on receiving one, I'm going to consider you a social signaler if you moved at least one of those awards manually to your user page to be displayed to everybody. Okay? So that's going to be the second measure that, that we're going to use. Here you can see the same user as before would be considered a social signaler by this measure as he has organized a little award section in his user page where he lists all of his barn stars, right? So two measures, right? Size of the user page, break the sample in two, relatively big, relatively not big. Uh, barn stars, conditional on receiving one, whether you decide to advertise them on your user page or not. That's going to be the measure of social image. Some practical challenge that we faced while designing this experiment, usually experiments are designed to be run in the lab, in a physical lab where people come in a room in a university. This is an online experiment. So obviously, people don't have time online. You need to guarantee a proper understanding of the decision problems. And we had some thoughts going into that. Just to give you a little bit of sense of that, uh, we uh, basically um, design flash animations, the one that you saw previously, that illustrate the basic gist of each game real quickly so that people can get a very quick sense of what's involved in the game without having to read through all those tedious instructions over and over again. That's one way we did it. And people also had, for instance, the opportunity to use earning calculators before actually making their decision. So you could try all the possibilities and the scenarios you were interested in before actually making your decision. When you feel confident that you've understood what's involved here, you make your decision. So this is how we, we went about uh, doing this, uh, this experiment. Subject pool. This is very important. How did we go about recruiting those uh, Wikipedia contributors? In all of the tables that I'm going to show you, in the subsequent analysis, what I'm going to try to explain is the number of contributions that subjects have made to the Wikipedia project, or number of edits that they've made, right? So in all of the tables that you're going to see, this is always the thing that I'm going to try to explain. We only recruit from Wikipedia registered users in order to be able to track their full contribution records. Uh, just to give you a little bit of a sense of uh, the dynamics of contributions uh, to Wikipedia, like many other features of the internet, if you think about contributions to open source software, think about participation in online message boards, uh, and Wikipedia too, the number of contributions that people make uh, is highly skewed. The vast majority of people never participate. A small majority of people make an astonishing amount of contributions. Um, digging into that a little bit, as of 2011, about 200,000 people registered a Wikipedia account each month. This is certainly a non-negligible influx of new contributors each month that potentially come in. However, the reflection uh, the, the, of what I was telling you before is that of those individuals, only 2% make 10 contributions or more within that first month. And only 10% of those 2% make one contribution within the following year. Right? As a result, as of 2007, most of the contributions still come from a very small number of contributors. And even within this group of highly engaged contributors, that I will call afterwards later in the talk the above median contributors or the super contributors, call them whatever you like, <coughs> there is high heterogeneity in the contribution records. Right? The vast majority of them made only a few hundred contributions. About 5,000 editors made more than 10,000 contributions. And you have 200 editors that have contribution records ranging from 100,000 to a million contributions. So this is really what we would like to capture in our sample of participants in our experiment and try to explain uh, as a feature of, of, of that space. In order to do that, we're going to recruit uh, or Wikipedia contributors from the three following experimental groups. The cohort of new Wikipedia contributors, all the guys who registered an account within a 30 days prior to the experiment. Those guys have typically contribution records ranging from zero for most of them to already 300 contributions, which is already quite a lot. 
Second, the group of engaged Wikipedia contributors. Those are the guys who already reached the threshold of 300 contributions and are still active in the project. And then kind of a separate group that I want to consider as a class of itself is the group of Wikipedia administrators. Those are contributors that come from the group of engaged contributors. Um, however, they opted in, selected in a very competitive peer review process, at the end of which the community of editors granted them, because they were considered trustworthy, with special oversight rights over the encyclopedia. Those are the guys who perform a policing role in the community. Those are the guys who are in charge of this, de uh, dealing with disruptive users. Those are the guys who can block those users, who can protect vandalized pages, who can erase pages if they think that those pages do not have the potential to become good Wikipedia articles. So I'm going to consider those as separate in the analysis. And I'm going to talk about regular contributors being group one and two. And Wikipedia admins are as being group, group three, right? OK, so this is the subject pool. How do we go about recruiting those guys? So basically what we used is the Wikipedia banner system. So we're in December. Normally, uh, the fundraiser uh, of Wikipedia has been launched. Um, those are, this is the system, a banner system that you see popping up at the top of every Wikipedia page each year asking you to donate money featuring the face of Jimmy Wells real big, right? Every year. Basically, we use the exact same mechanism to contact uh, our, uh, our Wikipedia contributors. We team up and partner with the Wikimedia Foundation to code that banner so that each and every time a Wikipedia contributor logs in Wikipedia. The system looks for his metrics, determines if he's eligible to participate in the study, that is, if he belongs to one of those three experimental groups. And if he does, displays the banner to him at the top of every Wikipedia page that he visits, right? Until he disables it or clicks on it. If he clicks on it, he's automatically redirected to the, econo the experimental economics platform that we own, is able to perform all of the games, have his earnings calculated, and he's paid in real money through an automated PayPal transfer in the end. Right? So this is how the process worked. Um, the experiment was kind of a, a success. Uh, practically speaking, we had uh, 850 subjects uh, completing uh, a 25 minutes experiment in eight hours. So this is our sample. Just to give you a little bit of a sense of how representative that sample is from the underlying population of Wikipedia contributors, here is uh, the distribution of the number of edits that those Wikipedia contributors made compared with the whole underlying population of eligible contributors. You can see, especially for Wikipedia administrators and engaged contributors, that the distribution match pretty closely. As far as new contributors are concerned, uh, the ones that we get on average are much more active. You see we don't have uh, that mass here at zero. Okay, another way to look at the problem of the representativity of our sample is to simply compare the demographic characteristics that we collected about those, uh, those, uh, those contributors against the demographic characteristics that, were, that was collected in the 2011 Wikimedia Editor Survey. This was the first survey whose purpose was explicitly to get as precise a snapshot as possible as, uh, of the demographic of the Wikipedia contributors. And you can see here that the numbers match up pretty closely, right? Some features are very well known. Female participation is really low. This is a research question of interest in its own right, in my opinion. Uh, people are usually older than what uh, some would assume initially, and also much more educated, right? You have 30% of the sample that has a master's or a PhD degree. So here comes the regression tables. As I said, always the things that we are going to explain here is the number of Wikipedia contributions that people make, right? And this is estimating here the impact of the demographic variables on the number of contributions that you make. So crash course in econometrics, for those who don't know about it, th those coefficients here basically tell you if you move from one unit in this variable, what's the predicted impact in terms of percentage change in the number of contributions that you make. 
right? The more stars you have next to the number, the more precisely estimated is the impact. If you don't have any stars, it, mean, it basically means you, you cannot have any confidence in the effect. The effect is basically zero. The more stars you have, the more significant it is. For instance, here, moving from being a male to being a female is precisely estimated as associated with a 36% decrease in the number of contributions that you make, controlling for all those other things. That's how you're going to interpret those tables. What is the source This is all public information. So the demographic variables you collected in the survey. The demographic information you collected in the survey at the end, when people play all the games, we ask them about those things, right? So it's their self-reporting. It's their self-reporting of their age, gender, gender, things like that. That's right. And then the number of contributions they make is public information. So you can just extract that. OK, so some demographic characteristics actually predict the number of contributions that people will make. However, you have some interesting underlying heterogeneity here. If you cut that sample, the whole sample here is the whole sample of Wikipedia of regular contributors, non-admins, right? Now, cut that sample in two according to the, num to the median number of Wikipedia contributions that they made, which is here in the sample 1,900 contributions already. It's a pretty high number. Run the exact same analysis on both subgroups, the below median and the above median group. The above median group are the so-called super contributors, right? What you basically see here is that the demographic variables significantly predict the number of contributions the below median group from being a non-contributor to an engaged contributor. Once you're an engaged contributor, well, it's very difficult to predict how far you're going to go, even with basic demographic variables. Among super contributors, very difficult to predict what happens in the space. You can see here the figure for admins too. So, right, this is already interesting in itself. But what I'm going to do here, back to our interest about pro-social motivations to contribute to Wikipedia, controlling for those things, that is, holding those things equal, we're going to see what's the predictive power of or measures of altruism, reciprocity, social image, if any, on the number of contributions that people make to Wikipedia. Here is the basic result for altruism, either with the dictator normal or the directed dictator, where you play with another Wikipedia contributor. Basically, no stars, which means no predictive power at all. By those measures, altruism does not play a role in number of Wikipedia contributions that you make by those measures. The picture is somewhat different if you look at reciprocity. Both measures, public goods and trusts, yield consistent results. In the whole sample of regular contributors, I'm not talking about admins here, um, an increase in reciprocity, and this is always in both games, this tells you moving from no reciprocity in the game to full reciprocity in the game. What's the impact in terms of percentage? 38.8% here, right? Those are precisely estimated uh, and are positive. Again, break the sample into according to the median number of Wikipedia contributions, just like I did with demographic variables. Rerun the analysis, and what you get is that the coefficient rises by 50% and is highly statistically significant in the below median group. However, is not significant at all in the, in the above median group. What that essentially tells you is that a preference for reciprocity, conditional cooperation, you participate or participate. You edit my article, I'm going to come back and edit your, uh, your, your article. We're going to collaborate on this thing, right? That preference can lead you from being a non-contributor to an engaged contributor. Once you're an engaged contributor, that preference doesn't predict how far you're going to go if you're a super contributor, right? That's the basic message. So, so far, altruism by the measures that we have do not seem to predict anything. Reciprocity does. What about social image? Let me give you some, a few um, descriptive statistics about both variables. The one based on user pages, the size of the user page. The one based on whether you moved your band stars. Basically, all Wikipedia contributors have a potentially blank Wikipedia user page. So I have everybody in the sample here. The sample is, ba is basically broken in two. Those who have relatively big user pages, those who have relatively small user pages. As I said, Barnstar is different. 81% of regular contributors 
who received Barnes stars are in the above median group, the so-called super contributors. So when I use this variable derived from the Barnes star, this will mainly tell me about what happens in that group of super contributors, right? So let's do the exact same thing. Controlling for demographic variables, insert both variables in the model, see whether they have some predictive power. As it turns out, based on user page, it does. Here, being a social signaler is associated with a 130% rise in the predicted number of contributions you make. Again, the coefficient rises by 50% and is highly statistically significant in the below median group. But this time, unlike reciprocity, by both measures, user page and barn stars, social image continues to push towards higher level of contributions even within the group of super contributors, the above median group, right? Okay, so again, trying to sum up, trying to keep everybody with me. Um, altruism does not seem to play a role by all measures. Reciprocity does, conditional co cooperation, up to a certain point. Social image does, too. So the question of interest here now is, what's the interaction between both motivational drivers, right? Reciprocity and social image. Do they play for the same people, for different people? So what we're gonna do to try and answer that question is that we're gonna re-estimate the impact of reciprocity here, but for both subgroup of social signalers and non-social signalers separately. See what happens. Here is the table. So if you focus here, whole, whole sample and below median, that's reciprocity for social signalers, reciprocity for non-social signalers, reciprocity social signalers based on the trust measure, again, non-social signalers based on the trust measure. What you see here consistently is that the effect is statistically significant always and only in the group of non-social signalers. That is, reciprocity incentivizes contributions only for those who are not concerned about their social image in the community. What that suggests is that both motivational drivers are at play in the population, but in different subsets of the population. If you're motivated by your social image, you will not be motivated by reciprocity. And the reverse holds too. Again, you can break that down in the above median group and pretty much nothing happens. As we saw, reciprocity doesn't have a, a big role to play to predict the trajectory of those who are already engaged in Wikipedia. Okay, so, so far so good. That's already a great deal of information. Let me try now and move out of the case of regular contributors and focus on the case of Wikipedia administrators. As I said previously, this is a kind of a special group because those are engaged contributors who opted in a very competitive and costly peer review process in order to be granted with special oversight rights over the encyclopedia. So those are the guys who perform the policing role in the community and they're in charge of dealing with disruptive users and managing, maintaining, curating the encyclopedia and so on and so forth and have some special rights to do that. Let's run the exact same analysis, altruism versus reciprocity versus social image on that group of Wikipedia administrators. Result for altruism, same thing, no predictive power at all by either measures, right? Here are the results for reciprocity. And so this is kind of surprising, right? This basically tells you that within the group of Wikipedia administrators, Wikipedia participation is negatively associated with your taste for reciprocity and conditional cooperation. So that seems surprising at first, but to me suggests some kind of a thick skin hypothesis, right? So those are the guys who exhibit the most extreme contribution records, and they are in charge of dealing with disruptive users. And so I'm gonna try and dig into that a little bit later on, suggest some, some hints about what could explain this. That's for reciprocity. Uh, what about social image? Well, by the user page measure, we get a significant impact, uh, but not by the, by the barn stores one. So we get some evidence that social image continues to drive participation within the group of Wikipedia administrators. 
but it's less strong than for regular contributors. Okay, so before I try and, and, and wrap up and open the floor for a question, which I'm sure you have uh, many, um, let me try and dig a little bit into that thick skin hypothesis for, for the, the Wikipedia admins. And what I'm going to do here is that I'm going to exploit the data that, that I have left and not used so far, because it wasn't relevant to the theoretical discussion I'm having um, in terms of economic theory about trusting behavior in the trust game. So you remember the trust game, right? You have a truster and a trustee. Both of them are endowed with $10. The truster decides how much he wants to send to the trustee. The amount is multiplied by three. Then the trustee has a de decision to make. How much does he want to send back? For the time being, that measure of how much he wants to send back was our measure of reciprocity. Now we're going to be interested in the amount that the truster decides to send in the first place. This can be interpreted as a measure of trust towards anonymous strangers, right? The guy that plays as the trustee has no incentives at all, no obligation to return anything to you. So if you decide to pass on some fraction of your endowment to that random stranger, which you will never meet again, well, that means that you're some kind of a trusting type towards strangers. So I'm going to use this trust measure and hypothesize that within the group of Wikipedia administrators, those who decide to perform relatively more their policing role will be relatively less trusting of strangers. Before I do that, first step, let me try and correlate that trust measures with the number of contributions that people make within the group of regular Wikipedia contributors, not admins. This is the result that you get. Basically, no effect which was to be expected, right? Why would you think that trust would have an impact on the number of contributions you make to Wikipedia? However, if you run that analysis among the group of Wikipedia administrators now, you see a negative correlation between the extent of their Wikipedia participation and their level of their generalized trust as measured by this experiment. Try and precise that a little bit we collect the number of users that each of those Wikipedia administrators blocked, uh, the number of pages that they decided to protect, the number of pages that they decide to delete from the encyclopedia. All of those uh, correlate negatively with the level of their general trust in the experiment, significantly so in two out of three measures. Last piece of evidence that we have here is we ask those Wikipedia admins what's the fraction of their time that they spend on Wikipedia performing this administrative role. So what's the fraction of your time that you spend on Wikipedia that you spend performing those admin edits? We only have 27 observations here, but still we're able to identify a negative correlation with general trust. The more they say and self-report that they spend time doing admin edits, the less they are trusting of uh, general strangers. So now, this could be interpreted in two ways. And I don't think that we have the data here to tease those explanations apart. And I want to make that very clear, right? You could interpret that as the simple fact that, you know, people are diversely motivated in the world. They self-select into different contribution patterns. And we need those administrators to protect the encyclopedia from potential free riders or disruptive users. Those guys are performing a very valuable role. And we're simply able to explain through those experimental measures how those people self-select what's the ecology of contributors to Wikipedia. Another way to go about interpreting these results is that basically uh, those uh, Wikipedia administrators are able to use their power uh, in a way that can uh, trigger some frustration in the community and that's correlated with the lower level of trust that we have. So this is kind of the negative interpretation. And I have no way to disentangle those two with the experimental data that I have. So I look forward to uh, hearing if you have ideas about that, try and tease those apart. But this is where I stand at the moment, and this is still a work in progress. OK, so trying to wrap up real fast, just to uh, go back to the broad picture here. This is really the first comprehensive test of the relative role of those three theoretical classes of pro-social preferences um, 
that has been put forward by economic theory to try and explain why would people be willing to contribute in those kind of public goods uh, dilemma situations. Altruism versus reciprocity versus social image. What we do is that we combine experimental and observational data from Wikipedia, which is a real world public good in which extrinsic incentives, traditional monetary incentives, play no role in shaping individual behavior. Conclusion for all regular contributors, what we learned so far, so the non-admin guys. Reciprocity and social image, but not altruism by the measures that we have, appear as deep underlying social motives that predict the trajectory of Wikipedia users from being a non-contributor to being an engaged Wikipedia contributor. In this process, reciprocity and social image seem to be substitutes rather than complements, which means that both are at play, but in different subsets of the population of contributors. Third, a taste for reciprocity does not continue to predict the trajectory of those Wikipedia users who become super contributors, the so-called above median group that I told you about, while a taste for social image does. This is uh, what we learn for regular contributors. What about Wikipedia administrators? Well, there is some evidence that the taste for social image continues to motivate their participation. However, reciprocity preferences are consistently negatively associated with their, the extent of their participation in Wikipedia within this group, which suggests some kind of a fixed skin uh, hypothesis. And we try to test and get at that hypothesis a little bit more directly by leveraging the data that we have on trust towards strangers in our trust experiment and see that it correlates negatively with the amount of policing edits or um, policing kind of activities that Wikipedia uh, administrators perform uh, within Wikipedia. That's basically the the message that I wanted to convey to you today. I look forward to uh, talking some more, hearing your comments. As I said, this is still work in progress. So if you have alternative explanations, things you think I should check, uh, data that I should collect, and so on and so forth, I'm very much looking uh, forward uh, to, to, to hearing about it. This is uh, collective work that I also did with Yochai, who made it possible for me uh, to do all those things. I wouldn't be here today if he wasn't there. So uh, yeah, thank you. As a possible alternative explanation for why reciprocity might be less of a motivator for the administrators, I wonder if you've considered that when you're in the administrator role, you are going above and beyond what the typical community member is doing. You, so you are not being reciprocated by the bulk of the people benefiting from your work. Is that ruled out by the data? Is that something you thought about? I think it's not ruled out by the data, and I think it's a perfectly reasonable interpretation of why we do not see uh, an effect of reciprocity in this above median group. I think that seems perfectly reasonable. You can think that you know, a reciprocity mechanism can lead you only so far, but once you already reach 2,000 contributions, how further can it lead you? you know? So I think that's a pretty reasonable interpretation, although I'm sure there are others. Yeah. Any? Well, you had your hand waved for it. Just have a curiosity question. Uh, before you did the analysis, did you have any predictions about what you would find about what the relative roles of the two different motivations might be for the populations? Or was it really a, let's see what we have uh, when we do the analysis? So that was pretty much the spirit. That the, mm -hmm. the thing is that those theories have been rationalizing uh, the fact that people often want to cooperate in the field and that we observe that in many real world situations. And we really wanted to run some kind of a horse race between those theories, trying to see how well they map onto actual field behavior in a context that we care about here, Wikipedia, right? With the broad picture about peer production and, and, and things like that. So we have no prior as to which one would work best. Uh, although we have an extensive literature in the lab uh, that pointed at the fact that social image and reciprocity uh, are more effective 
at sustaining cooperation, that altruism, which doesn't necessarily mean that altruism does not have a role, you know? So, yeah. I didn't hear the first question because I was on the uh, overflow seating, so forgive me if it's, uh, I couldn't quite hear it, so maybe it's repeating what you asked, but um, my question is about like the interpretation of the results. Um, I mean, so, so the language you've been using um, you know, describes these um, as, as underlying motives that predict, um, you know, sort of the, the results and, and levels of contribution. But I mean, is it also possible that, um, uh, you know, the it's kind of the causation is working the other way, that uh, participating more in Wikipedia is making people more concerned about social image um, or reciprocity up to a certain level? Yeah, that's that's a perfectly reasonable interpretation. And when I talk about prediction here. I'm not, I'm not like um, ruling out the fact that those are only correlations, right? So this could go the other way around. But I talk about prediction here because what I'm really interested in is looking at whether those experimental measures that have been used extensively in the lab, we have tons and tons of papers that use those experiments to try and tease out uh, alternative explanations about pro-social preferences, whether we can take the result of those experiments to the field and whether they have some predictive power of what people actually do outside of the lab. In that sense, you can say that those experimental measures predict what people do in the real world, so to speak. Then, the question of whether preferences evolve as a result of your participation, of whether you have a fixed preference parameter uh, with which you are born, and that predicts what's going to happen in your life afterwards, I can't say. Uh, and it's probably a little bit of both. Yeah, but the, the goal is really to map the experimental literature in the lab with what people actually do in the field. In that sense, you can talk about predictions, uh, I, I believe. Um, so I think one of your most fascinating findings is that you found that those who play uh, an increasing policing role as administrators actually leads to less trustworthiness for strangers. And you know how you were saying that you're not sure if there's a more positive and negative explanation for why that is, and you're not sure about how to tease that out. There's a, a really great study by Heather Ford, and she does the qualitative work on Wikipedia entries, where she looks at why articles are deleted for non-Western events or topics. And what she finds is that the notability criteria is that um, for people who are not close to the event, they have a different kind of criteria for the no notability criteria. And so I'm wondering if you could one way to look at this, another way to ask the question is, you know, do the pro-social motivations change depending on one's embeddedness to the topic? So, like, you can operationalize embeddedness by, you know, geographic co-presence or the cultural, you know, um, connection to the event. But essentially, she's finding that outsiders were, were competing against local knowledge. And they were saying, well, your local knowledge is not valid, and so we think it should be deleted. And it's creating these tensions you have, you know, these administrators are really in a very, um, you know, empowered position, uh, are making these kind of decisions. Well, uh, thank you, thank you very much for pointing that 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 to me. Uh, I would be definitely interested in, in having the reference of the paper you're talking about. I, would, I don't know about it, so I'd be happy to to have a look and see whether that can help me. Yeah, thanks. Um, thinking also on that same topic. I read um, Thinking Fast and Slow by Daniel Kahneman, and it feels to me that there is an inherent bias of those administrators that they're not seeing, of 100% of contributions, they're focused on the point and percent of irritating jerks. <laughs> and so that, it's, that becomes a large piece of their mindset. And I would say at Zipcar, the people who are doing the fleet work are the people who think, that users are mostly jerks because they're out there fiddling with people who do jerky things. They don't see, you don't see, they're not seeing it, what percentage of action it is. They're focused on that bad behavior. So for me, it feels very natural that if I spend all of my time looking at bad behaviors, I'm going to think people are bad because I can <laughs> look at the entire percentage. Um, yeah. I, you, I bet you'd find that in police departments. I bet you'd find it, you know, in correctional counselors. Teachers who are who, who um, yell at students who do bad things. I mean, if you're just focused on the bad subset, well, then that's what you think. Yeah, that's that's uh, well. The, your point about uh, 
police departments, stuff like that. There are certainly experiments that I'd like to run there. Uh, but um, but um, yeah, again, you know, what's the real percentage of disruptive users that you have out there? I told you the numbers. The number of people who are actually willing to cooperate and sustain their contributions in that space is quantitatively large, relatively really low. So, you know, you have a lot of disruptive users out there. So I'm not sure what kind of interpretation we can push based on these data. That, that was the, the meaning of my message. Uh, it could very well be that, you know, uh, you get a lot of disruptive users out there and you need uh, people uh, who are in charge and able to deal with them, and this is a good thing. If those guys weren't around, the whole project may collapse, and Wikipedia is, as a matter of fact, a very successful project. However, there have been some discussions going around about newbie frustration and um, you know the, this whole don't bite the newbie kind of uh, can, kind of uh, kind of stuff this can also align with that kind of interpretation which is the one that i see you uh, pushing a little bit more again i'm i'm not sure uh, which way it goes and i don't have the data to to answer that question yeah please I met out uh, some social network based on people's interaction and the contribution to a project. So what I've realized is that you know, there's a similar finding about administrators or managers of projects. They didn't interact with a lot of people and they didn't have many contributions compared to you know, other active users. So I was wondering how, maybe that's a question, how the organization was organized and how the labor was divided. So, yeah, so it seems like a hierarchy that as a manager or administrator, you don't need to interact with a lot of people, but you interact with, you know, level down people, which, you know, are quite a small number of contributors. And my question is, you talk about trust correlated with, you know, administrators' work. So I wonder, you know, that the game is about, I give you money, but money is based on the trust of your capacity, of your skills, or actually, your ability of utilizing money to hire other people or to, you know, I don't know, to, 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 to buy labor or to do other things. I'm not sure how the trust is, you know, based on, what, what kind of, what's the base of the trust? Uh, what's the base of the trust? So, as I understand it, as I understand it, you're asking me uh, whether by using an experiment which involves money, right. I can really get at a trust preference yeah, I didn't that mean does not necessarily it. involve yeah. money? Is that the question you're asking? Yeah, I didn't mean to, you know, ask you a difficult question, but I was trying to interpret why, why you know, administrators would have this kind of relationship with trust. So could that be actually the trust, you know, carries other information and carries other factors that we haven't thought about? <laughs> yeah, that's a deep question. I'm not sure how to how to respond to that. Yeah. We'll think about it. We can talk about it afterwards if you like. Um, David? Um, I'm holding on, I'm probably not even holding on by the skin of my teeth to the argument I'm on the back of. So this is very naive. Um, so if I wanted to take, if, if I'm a journalist, I'm going to take the wrong conclusion from your report. The report, the conclusion I'm going to draw, and I know it's the wrong one, is oh, Wikipedia administrators um, are not motiv motivated by altruism. That's the wrong conclusion. And regular Wikipedia. contributors either, right? Well, by I'm those measures. I'm trying to keep the one example I keep in my head at the time. So just <laughs> as Everybody example, seems to be focusing on the Wikipedia administrators. That's the last thing so it's a thing that I remember. <laughs> administrators are not motivated by altruism. What that actually means is there's no correlation between the sort of crazy standard test for altruism, which tests altruism in a highly artificial um, environment. And so the conclusion, uh, conclusion I might take from this, especially if I had self-reported data, if you were to ask the administrators, um, why are you doing this? And they were reporting, well, it's, for the, it's making the world better. And do you trust people? Oh, yeah, I trust lots of I don't trust the, the bastards who are screwing up Wikipedia, but I love <laughs> the other administrators and the other contributors and all the new users. Or, we're a very trusting environment. It's just this one set of bastards I don't trust. Um, but is the right conclusion from this that, uh, so first of all, is the right conclusion from this that there may be an issue about the tests that are being, the standard tests that are being used to um, 
to, uh, well, to test very deep and difficult human motivations such as altruism. Um, and uh, second of all, is there, is, is there a method maybe through self-report to see whether in fact, to get back to Justin's very first question, um, is there a real correlation? Are the self-reports, um, would the administrator say, no, we're not doing this for altruistic reasons? I sort of guess otherwise, but I don't know. Okay, so on your first point, uh, what, I, what I understand that you're saying is, well, you know, you're running that weird dictator game altruism experiment trying to make an argument that this captures something about altruism, and you say, well, based on this measure, I don't see a correlation of number of contribution, therefore, altruism does not play a role. However, you could take the question the other way around and say, well, if it doesn't predict field behavior, it's because the measure is bad, right? And this is a point well taken, um, and I think this could perfectly be the case. That's why I said throughout the presentation, by those measures. Uh, but really, the approach that I'm trying to take here is a cumulative scientific knowledge approach. So those are measures that have been used to study altruism in the experimental literature for 30 years, right? So in a sense, in trying to build a castle of scientific knowledge, you want to see how much of that tells you about what happens in the real world. And in that sense, it's still relevant to use those as measures of altruism and talk to the, uh, to the crowd of economists and see what we can learn from that. But yeah, presumably we may come up with better measures of altruism that could explain what happens in that space. And so, you know, if you frame it to an economic theory audience, uh, you would frame it as I framed it, then your comment is perfectly well taken. Altruism may play a role in Wikipedia, I'm just not capturing it with those measures. Um, regarding the second point, um, self-report versus experiments, I would make the you know, traditional answers uh, that economists, especially experimental economists make uh, to those kind of comments. Uh, you know, economists in general are, are very dubious of self-reports. Uh, economists are not so interested about what you tell me you do, but what about you actually do when I see you doing it, right? And so this is a... all their time trying to make the world better. So why doesn't that count as altruism? Well, would be the other... the, you know, the fact that they spend their time and that as a byproduct of that they make the world better doesn't mean that their deep inner motivation yeah. is to make the world better. And you could tell me all sorts of things about your motivations to do many things in life, that you just want me to hear, which is why I worry a little bit about self-reports. Of course, if I ask you, well, you know, uh, David, do you work to make the world better? Of course you're gonna tell me that you work to make the world better, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so in a sense, uh, that's, that's, that, that's the question. That doesn't mean that self-reports aren't useful. That means that, you know, you can try and look at what people actually do in very simple frames like this, and if that predicts what people do in context, it means that you have some identified, at least in my mind, something deep that's going on here, right? If people's reciprocity behavior in such a simple game, decontextualized game, can predict the number of contributions you make to Wikipedia, I would have an argument that reciprocity has a role to play. If it doesn't work, that doesn't mean that altruism does not have a role to play. Um, you know? So, yeah, Yochai so had a comment. translation, right, which is, Altruism is used in a common conversation and parlance to talk about to what, often to refer to what in economics would be described more generally as pro-social motivations. That is to say, things other than what's in it for me. Once you're actually trying to study um, at a much finer grain in order to design interventions, you need to be much more precise in the subsets of motivations that go into this packet that in a background piece you might call altruism generally as compared to selfishness. Altruism in this case is the subset of things that is entirely unmotivated, unconditional on the conditions and anything. It's just here. Um, and that's a very, that's a relatively, that's a subset of the population. In most of the experiments, it's about 20% of people who have that. But there's a much broader set of pro-social motivations uh, and, and, and so the, part of it is just translation between how we use altruism generally and what we use it for in these more precise mm. things. And so I would add to that on top of the, you know, kind of what economists call the demand effect. If I ask you why you do something, you're going to be willing to give me the answer that I want to hear, which is one problem with that. The other problem with that is that you may not be aware yourself of why you're doing things. 
which is why, you know, simply looking at your behavior in very simple scenarios like this can help us understand and unpack what your motivations are. Yeah. yeah. So you, you talk a lot about pre motivation, altruism, and capacity and complexity. Um, but where does power and control fit into that? I mean, I would say that uh, administrators, some of them are control freaks. I actually know one, so I, 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 I can attest to you with that. But aren't you leaving something very important though? So I will not endorse that statement officially. Uh, <laughs> and even, no, no, even, no. even unofficially, uh, by the way. Not the theoretical uh, part, but the theoretical part. What about? You know, in terms of, in terms of, the, of the theory, those are the theory that we have around for quite a long period of time. Um, control is not a pro-social motivation as I defined it, right? Um, I'm, I was mainly interested in the motives that could push you to contribute in those right. kind of, okay. of dilemmas right. that are social in nature. Right. That means you take into account the utility of others in calculating your own. Right. And those are the things that I'm trying to tease apart here. You could also think that you know people contribute to Wikipedia because it's fun. And that has nothing to do with social motivations. But this is not something that has been uh, theorized uh, explicitly. So I want to start with the theories that we have uh, and that have been around for a long time and trying to tease them out. This is awesome. Here, there, here are two things that I tripped up on that maybe you're helpful or not. And I sort of relate to some of these issues about what do measures mean. The one, con one confound that strikes me as reasonably likely is that you use the number of words that someone writes on a user page as a proxy for their sort of social desirability um, in a context where the activity that people are doing is writing words on a page. Um, and so it seems like, I mean, I, in lots of contexts you can say people who write, people, people could be writing user pages for lots of reasons. One of those deep underlying things could be, could be because people like to write um, in any context. Um, and the particularly confounding part here is you're basically measuring people's sort of predilection to writing in one setting based on their predilection to writing in another setting, but attributing their motivations in the first setting to sort of social utility as opposed to just like enjoying writing or something like that. It just seems like, like, like they're particularly confounded by the fact that they're doing the same kind of thing in both places. Um, so I don't know if that's of interest or you have a comment. And then my second piece is I couldn't quite get why you were saying that that uh, reciprocity predicts people moving from non-contributors to median contributors in the sense that it seems like it moves them from minimal contributors to median contributors. It seems like the flip from non-contributor to contributor, if you wanted to, if you want to measure that sort of like important kind of zero to one moment, you somehow have to get the people who are like literally not contributors. Um, if I've signed up for an account page, I'm sort of already, like even if, I, even yeah, if I've okay. never made a contribution, I'm already sort of a non-contributor. Um, so it just, I mean, it seems like it's not quite evidence of flipping from zero to one, it's evidence of going from, you know, 0.0001 to 0.5 or something like that, which is important. Well, we, do, we do have uh, registered users in the sample who made zero contributions, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, in that sense, you're really identifying, econometrically speaking, what, what makes you move from zero to something, and you can explain some of that something, but up to a certain point, doesn't explain anymore. Among so registered non-contributors. Yeah. Then another way to go about, uh, about doing that is you could simply study the decision to contribute versus not, which is another way to go. Uh, but yeah, I, I see this as being a matter of terminology or do you disagree? There is something deeper. Uh, or the econometric model that I put. I, I guess like, so, so it seems to me one of the things you'd want to do with an ec econometric model is then start saying like, okay, so how do we start applying this? Um, in, like, like, so, you know, how could, how could we, I don't, I mean, I guess I don't know what you want to do. I mean, there's like, you could just be fascinated by it to understand human psychology, but especially it seems like what economists do is they say, okay, like, what are the levers that we can start yanking on, you know, if we're running out of contributors to get more contributors or to get more people to stay or things like that. And so from that point of view, well, saying yeah. that reciprocity motivates non-contributors to become contributors might not apply super well to, um, to register non-contributors. I mean, even well, the notion of a you, you can have there really are a lot of registered non-contributors. Like I make a Wikipedia page and then literally do nothing. Yeah, as I as I as I uh, said during the presentation, I showed some numbers. You have two hundred thousand people who register a Wikipedia account each month, mm -hmm. right? Only ten percent of those men make some contributions. Make ten or more, you said. Ten or more, but two percent of those ten percent are found to make one contributions within the within the following year. Mm -hmm. So you know. 
the people who create the public good value of Wikipedia are really those users who sustain their contributions over time. Mm -hmm. So if you're willing to think about policy interventions, you can think about increasing the degree of, uh, of communication and connectedness between editors. You know, there have been some interve interventions in Wikipedia around those lines, like the thank button that makes you relate to other people uh, easily, uh, the, the welcome uh, Wikipedia group, which uh, welcome new users and things like that. Those are all things that align with that reciprocity uh, kind of motive. Um, yeah, so that would be, oh, I forgot half of your question. I really forgot. But maybe we can talk about it yeah, afterwards. Sure. Maybe one last question. Yeah, I really love this. Thank you. Um, I know that there's a lot of talk in technology platform design of creating designs that are influenced by or even like take into account like experiments of various kinds. Um, it seems to me like studies like this or the stuff coming out of the Facebook data science team work really well for well-established platforms um, that have large numbers of users. What, what is your sense of the scope of uh, possibility for the kind of methods that you apply? Is it only applicable to like the top 100 most traffic websites in the world? Or is this the kind of thing that um, the people who are creating, evolving new platforms can be thinking about as well? So in terms of methodology, this is the kind of thing that I like to run on all the platforms of peer production of the world, right? This is how I think we would build real strong cumulative knowledge because this is obviously one particular context, one particular platform which is really successful, already established, and so on and so forth. So we really need more experiments of that kind and we're working on, on one follow-up with, with, with Yochai with uh, over a thousand open source software contributors at SourceForge uh, which allows to study explicitly how those pro-social motivations interact with monetary incentives, right? Because about half of the contributors to open source software is a well-known fact, are being paid to contribute. So how do those motivations actually play out with one another is the next step. But there are many other platforms to which we should apply those kind of methodology to try and have some, some deep conclusions about it, scientifically speaking. As far as the policy side is concerned, I would like to believe that you can generalize some of this stuff to many other settings. Again, empirically speaking, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trained as, a, as, an, as an economist. I don't have the data to answer that question. I don't know. So, well, thank you very much, everybody, for being here. Uh,